Just like his predecessor episode, Black and Blue is more about plots being designed than plots being executed, which might be slightly disappointing for some viewers given the promised fireworks of season 6, but like every episode of Better Call Saul, there were some beautifully crafted character moments that deserve to be highlighted and discussed. There wasn't one symbol I believe sums up the episode, so I'm going to take a more conventional approach to this analysis, just so I can cover what I want to cover. The episode begins with a visual callback to Breaking Bad. The precise scientific procedure, the liquid substance turning solid, it's very reminiscent of one of Walter's cooks. In playing over the creation process is a German song titled In Silent Night. I'll leave a link to the lyrics below if you want to check them out, but in short, it's a poem about mourning and sorrow, and it foreshadows the inclusion of Werner's widow, which I'll touch on later. Like most episodes so far this season, Kim was the standout for me, and I love what they do with her visually in black and blue. We ended last episode with Kim being let in on the Lalo situation by Mike, and he also tells her why she's getting that information and not Jimmy. Black and Blue develops those events with some pretty cleverly composed shots. When we meet Kim in episode 6, she's awake at 3.17 in the morning, which spells a lie if you didn't notice, and she's kept up by the threat of Lalo's return. Now in previous seasons, this was Jimmy's situation. He would constantly hide information from Kim, and then his conscience would give him a beating for it. But times have changed. It's now Jimmy who's in the dark, which is represented by this awesome shot. Kim's lamp shines, while Jimmy's remains off. And as the scene continues and Kim passes on yet another opportunity to tell Jimmy that they could be approached by Mr. Salamanca, she ends up sharing the frame with some... dirty laundry. You gotta love how they build sets in Better Call Saul. The attention to detail is second to none. So that is the informational aspect of Kim's current situation, but she has also taken Mike's words to heart about being made of sterner stuff. She's framed in a more powerful position in black and blue when she's with Jimmy. It begins with this shot here during their first scene together, but they really push this dynamic when Jimmy comes back from his prize fight with Howard. Jimmy rolls into the parking lot, and Kim is literally looking down on Jimmy from their balcony. And the fact that he comes home beaten up with an ice pack on his face, you can just hear her thinking to herself, what did he get into this time? It's sort of infantile and only confirms the sentiment Mike put forth. Kim's smoking and drinking habits are also reflective of her personal decay. She used to really only smoke and drink with Jimmy to let loose, but now she's doing both by herself, and she's doing it a lot, even on her nightstand as an empty wine glass. So she's blazing her own trail, to quote Jimmy, but she's also becoming more indulgent, and I expect Jimmy will take notice of this at some point. Kim also has lunch with a former colleague at Schweikert, and there are a couple of unique images in that scene as well, We get this one multiple times, the showrunners love using it to establish this particular setting, but we also receive a shot of Kim's reflection in her coffee. It's a creative shot, and I believe it's communicating the fact that Kim's intentions at this reunion are not what they appear to be. There is another side to Kim that this woman cannot recognize. She only sees a brave lawyer who gave up barrels of cash to fight for the little guy, but Kim is working her the entire time for information on Sandpiper. The whole conversation is a fever dream for Kim. She's given the exact compliments she's been foaming at the mouth to receive, and it only spurs her mission onward. Jimmy has an interesting episode. He continues to build up his office by hiring Francesca, which was a fun scene, but it's his interaction with Howard that everyone will remember. I've seen some people say that the boxing scene was slightly over the top. I don't think it was personally, I just would have taken out the first person stuff. I thought it was a little bit too gimmicky and didn't heighten the scene's emotional weight, but I appreciate the psychological foundation. Howard has been on the defensive for years in his battles with Jimmy, so it's not surprising that he'd want to turn the tables and become Tuco for one night, especially after learning about the incident with Kim. And the fight itself is super fun because the styles coincide with each character's personality. Jimmy plays to the crowd and fights dirty, Howard is disciplined and fights clean. The most important question about the fight scene is the same question Jimmy asked Kim. Why did I go in there? Why didn't I just go home? And I think the answer is that Jimmy has a lot of frustration deep down, mostly as a result of Kim, that needed to be released. And Howard has already triggered one outburst, so Jimmy isn't as hesitant to let his guard down a second time. And on the possibility of Jimmy wanting to get caught by Howard, I think that's right. I think Howard's observation was right on the mark. I suspect Jimmy wants the Howard charade to be over so Kim can go back to the person she once was. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen. She's an extremely strong-willed person who knows exactly what she wants, so barring interference from Lalo... Jimmy's going to have to watch her fade away. Before we move on to Lalo and Gus, special praise needs to be given to Patrick Fabian for his work as Howard. For me, Black and Blue was the best performance he's given in Better Call Saul, 
When Cliff tells him that he was meeting with Kim when the prostitute incident took place, Howard's reaction is phenomenal. He isn't one to fly off the handle, so Fabian had to inject a lot of emotion into a restrained reaction, and he does it perfectly. The speech he gives to the seniors to grasp victory from the jaws of defeat was another superb moment. He actually sounds quite similar to Kim in this scene when he tells the seniors that It's not about money. It's about sending a message. The show leaves it up to the viewer to determine who actually means what they say. The issue for Howard going forward is that he does not in fact have a Jimmy McGill problem. The two are almost like petulant brothers at this point. He has a Kim Wexler problem which is a much taller task because she doesn't have Jimmy's swindler reputation. Everyone believes she's pure at heart and cares deeply about justice. So even if Howard figures out that she's the brains behind the operation, it's going to be hard to convince other people of that revelation. Gus Fring gets a lot of screen time in black and blue, and once again, we're shown what effect Lalo's absence is having on his mind. His OCD has been dialed up to 13, and his paranoia up to 10. He's not the cool, calm head he is in Breaking Bad. I mean, he can hardly function when events are out of his control. That's the prison he's stuck in in episode 6. And this type of image is presented a few times during Black and Blue. I think they're really trying to give this entire season a claustrophobic tone. But I also like this shot as well. It's kind of like Gus has to literally move his business owner persona aside to observe his true self. The part of him that's anxious for confrontation and resolution. I prefer Gus's psychological demonstrations in this episode more than the ones from last week. Because from a filmmaking perspective, they were much more engaging. The tracking shot through Los Poyos Hermanos was incredible, and even the bathroom scene with Mike uses the mirror to great effect. It was like there were four characters squeezed into that little room. I'm not sure how I feel about the meth lab scene. It would feel a little outlandish for Gus to plant a gun in that room and eventually kill Lala with it like two months down the road. I would bet on it being a red herring. I don't think the writers would go for that either. But we'll have to see. I mean, Gus did use his spidey senses to avoid getting blown up in his car by Walter, so maybe I am just underestimating his power. While Gus lurks over his employees' shoulders and cleans bathtubs, Lalo is off in Germany living his best life. We've seen his charm within the cartel setting a number of times, but this is one of the only times we've seen his charisma utilized with a common civilian. And I'm curious to hear what people think about his time in Germany. The closing minutes were incredibly intense, but there's also a part of me that wishes Lalo was maneuvering back in Albuquerque with characters we actually know. Once a decision was made for Lalo to accept his status as a dead man, I think a lot of intriguing cartel political warfare was taken off the table. Now it is early, perhaps Lalo will make it back to Mexico and talk to Eladio about what he's learned about the lab and Bolsa's connections with Gus, but it doesn't feel like those conversations are being set up. Hopefully I'm wrong and Lalo is back in cartel territory before the mid-season finale concludes. There is also a moment between Lalo and Werner's wife where she mentions that lawyers came by her house and cleaned up Werner's work documents, and Lalo just shakes his head and says, Lawyers. I think it's safe to assume who Lalo was thinking about at that moment. A meeting with Kim is being built up. It's just a matter of what mood Lalo is in when they finally meet. Will he be the patient and charming Lalo, or will he be the psychotic Lalo who's looking for quick resolutions? Believe it or not, we are almost halfway through season 6, and there is still a lot to wrap up, especially if they want to have some episodes dedicated to Gene alone, I've never not trusted these writers to stick the landing, but it might be tricky, so I'm hoping next week we'll see a couple plot resolutions. Make sure to like and subscribe on your way out if you'd like to see more Season 6 content from me going forward, and leave your observations in the comments as well. I'd love to see some things I may have missed, but thank you so much for stopping by. Have a fantastic rest of your day. I'll talk to you soon.